We have to finish that debate uh, in the next year and a half, two years, because uh, proof of stake or proof of work will win out by uh, 2020, apparently. Okay, so I'm going to talk about um, efficient smart contracts in Bitcoin. Uh, discrete log contracts, taproot, and graphroot. Uh, not in that order. The order will actually be taproot, graphroot, and then discrete log contracts. Okay, so quick intro. Hi, I'm Tanj Dreija. Uh, I work here at MIT, uh, down the street, at the Digital, Digital Currency Initiative. I uh, was co-author of the Lightning Network paper, work on that. And I uh, work on discrete log contracts, which is more more recent thing that looks a lot like Lightning. And uh, I'm going to talk about Taproot, Graphroot, and DLC. This is probably going to be way too fast because I only have like 20 minutes and it's a lot of stuff. So it's more to like get you interested in it. And if you're like, wait, how does that work? Then come bug me later. I'll be around. Okay, so what is a smart contract? Uh, there's no real good answer to that question. Uh, a lot of people you know, think, oh, this is a smart contract. This is not. Some people say, you know, all outputs in Bitcoin are smart contracts because they use the Bitcoin script. And so even pay to pubkey hash while well, you're doing these operations, right? Op dupe, op, op hash 160, op equal verify. Um, so my definition here, I'm going to say, okay, pay to pubkey hash, nah, that's not really a smart contract, right? You're just sending money to a place. It's functionally the same as like using cash. Um, multi-sig, is multi-sig a smart contract where you have multiple signers and you can have some kind of threshold? Eh, maybe, kind of, that's iffy, but you could say it's, it's sort of novel, it's not really how cash works, it's kind of a multi-sig, uh, kind of a smart contract. Something like op check lock time verify, where, okay, there's an output and this person cannot spend it until a certain time has passed. Okay, that's kind of a smart contract, that's getting there, that's weird. Um, and then something like Lightning, where the scripts in Lightning have, are using multi-sig, are using op check lock time verify, and these revealing secrets to like revoke old states. I'd say, yeah, that's a smart contract, right? It's a fairly limited one compared to what many people are looking at. Um, but this is a smart contract, right? This is conditional payments and things like that. Okay, so how do we do smart contracts in Bitcoin? Uh, it's not the same model as Ethereum. You have, there's basically two, two output types that people, you can see uh, on Bitcoin today. You can say pay to pub key hash and pay to script hash. Um, with pay to pub key hash, there's a key. You send it to the key, that person can spend. Pretty straightforward. Pay to script, you say, okay, I'm going to take a, some kind of script, some kind of program, a predicate. I'm going to hash that, and I'll send to that. And when you want to spend from it, you reveal what the script actually was and execute it. Um, so they've got these two different things. And these two different things look different. And different is bad. Why is different bad in Bitcoin? Well, you want fungibility. You want uniformity. You want it so that when, you know, chain analysis, is that an actual company name? I don't know. Uh, those kinds of companies look at the blockchain, they get nothing, right? Ideally, they're just like, I don't know, there's a bunch of random numbers. There's a bunch of random outputs with uniform distribution of, of addresses and who knows what's going on. Uh, so you want to sort of, uni you make everything uniform. And so one idea to do that is taproot. Um, and this is uh, Greg Maxwell, who is, you know, sort of a Bitcoin guru. I don't know if he would appreciate that term, but, you know, he's got a big beard. He knows a lot about Bitcoin. Um, he wrote a post about this a uh, month or two, uh, January, end of January, so a couple weeks ago. Um, and it's really clever, and it merges pay to pub key hash and pay to script hash. Um, and it does this in a very, like, sort of annoyingly simple way that was like, wait, why didn't we think of that? Oh, well, he thought of that. Um, so you make a public key P, the same way you do with any of your addresses. And you make a script S. Let's say you have both. Um, and then you, what you do is you compute this key C and you send to that key. And C, if, okay, so I, did, I skipped the whole like elliptic curve operations and stuff. But if you're familiar with any of these things, this is how you turn a private key into a public key. You multiply by G. Um, and you can add public keys together. It's really quick and simple to do. And if you add the public keys, you can sign with the sum of the private keys, which is sort of the really cool part of this elliptic curve stuff. So what you do is you say, okay, I've got a key, a regular key pair. I've also got this script, and I perform this equation, right? I hash the public key and the script together, multiply that, by, you know, use that as a private key, you know, turn that into a public key, and add that to my existing public key. Um, this allows you to then have sort of both a script and a key smooshed into one thing. Uh, so C essentially is a, is a public key, but it's also got a script in it. Um, and then when you want to spend from it, you have the option to either use the key part or the script part. So 
if you want to treat it as pay to pubkey hash, just you say, okay, I'm a person, you know, I'm just signing off with this. Uh, you know your private key will just be your, private, your regular private key plus this hash that you computed, which you know. Um, and so you just sign as if there were no script. And no one can even detect that there was a script here. It just looks like a regular signature. Um, however, when you want to reveal the script, you just reveal P and S, and everyone can compute this equation at the top. Okay, is C equal to P plus the hash of P and S times G? They say, oh, yeah, it is. Okay, I'll now execute the script. Um, so now it's a way to merge pay to script hash and pay to pub key hash into one. Um, it's really nice because in many cases with smart contracts, there's almost every case, there's a bunch of people getting together for a smart contract, right? And if all of those entities sign off on the outcome, you don't really care what the smart contract was, right? In, in, if everyone agrees, don't show the contract, just everyone agrees. It's sort of like in real life, you may enter into contracts all the time. You enter into employment contracts, rental agreements, everything. You don't go to court, right? Everyone agrees, so you just go with it. Um, there's no disagreement, so you don't need to use the contract itself. The contracts then exist only in the case where there are disagreements, and then you can fall back, reveal it. Uh, so the idea is, in this case, C, you know, P could be a sum of keys from a bunch of uh, participants. So that's cool. Um, this would make it a lot more useful. Okay, and then a few weeks later, even cooler idea. Well, I don't know which is cooler. Um, graph tree. So the idea is, okay, you have a similar idea as, as Taproot of we have a key we can sign with or we can reveal that there's actually a script. Um, it's in some ways even simpler. You send to the key C, and then if you want to use the sort of data pub key hash model, there's no hash involved, you just spent from that key. Or you say, hey, this key signed a script. So now run that script. So it's basically, if someone sends me money, I can either spend the money by signing the transaction or I sign a script and then execute that script. The really cool thing about this is I can add scripts after I've received the money. Right? So I can say, okay, it's my money, or it can be this two of three multisig. And I sign off on that. And like, I can keep adding people into this contract after I've created it uh, without touching the blockchain at all. Um, so this is really cool. It's, it's in some ways like MAST, which is a way to um, have a whole bunch of different scripts that could be executed. Um, and it's simple, and the scaling is really great because you can sign a million different scripts with this key, and then all million of those are possible ways to spend the money, and there's no overhead on the blockchain. Right? The, block, the blockchain overhead ends up being 32 bytes um, because you know, this, uh, the 32 bytes, you can sort of squish the signatures together. Um, the downside is you have to sign. Right? So in Taproot and pay to pub key hash, pay to script hash, it's only operating on public keys. So anyone can just take your public key and send money to it. Or anyone can take your public key and a script and combine those and use Taproot. Uh, in the case of Graftroot, however, there needs to be signatures involved. And so someone's private key has to be online. So it doesn't work quite as well with like cold storage, offline wallets. Um, but the upsides are pretty huge in that you've got these really cool uh, you know, scripting at like really good scaling. OK, probably questions about that, but I've got 10 minutes left. Um, now I'll talk about discrete log contracts, which can, could definitely use some of these scripts, um, but it's a slightly different way to, this is an actual sort of apl application, not just a sort of primitive to use. Um, so it looks a lot like Lightning, and you know, I came up with it from working on Lightning for years, and saying, well wait, well, couldn't we do this instead? Uh, and hopefully I can reuse like 80, 90% of the code, maybe 80, I don't know. Um, because I don't want to have to rewrite all the things. Um, so the idea of Lightning is you've got this multi-sig output. You keep making new transactions. And in Lightning, the most recent transaction is valid, right? And all the old transactions are invalid. Um, in discrete log contracts, you've got a different way to choose which, which, output is val which uh, transaction is valid. You've got this non-interactive oracle, which can determine uh, a valid transaction. So I have a little graphic. Oh, no, not yet. Wait. Oh. Uh, let me do, wait, let me do the graphic first, and then I'll go back. Um, so yeah, in Lightning, well, that title's wrong, oops. Um, <laughs> in Lightning, you say, okay, we've got this funding transaction, right? We've got 10 Bitcoins that are shared between Alice and Bob, and they can keep sending them back and forth. So the first, in the first you know, state, at time one, Alice has one coin, Bob has nine coins. 
And then um, Bob sends some coins to Alice. Now the state two is they have five and five. And they invalidate state one to make sure that neither of them broadcast state one. So they know that, OK, this is our real balance. Uh, and then they make a third state. OK, now Alice has most of the money. And they invalidate state two. Uh, so they're only really able to broadcast state three, which means that you know, they actually have the money. If they try to broadcast either of the old states, they lose everything. Um, so that's the mechanism that Lightning operates with. Um, with discrete log contracts, it's a different mechanism where they create all possible outcomes of this contract at the, at the first, you know, when they're first building it, the first outset. Um, so you can have the same, you know, it looks exactly the same on the, in terms of transactions, right? They still have a multi-sig, two of two at the top, and they're building three or four or a million transactions descending from it um, with different output amounts. However, in this case, they're taking an Oracle's key um, and saying, OK, there's three possible outcomes for tomorrow's weather. There's, it's going to be sunny, it's going to be cloudy, or it's going to be rainy. And given one of these outcomes, that's what will determine which of these transactions is valid. And so, OK, today's cloudy. So this transaction is now sort of endorsed by the Oracle. The Oracle has no idea this is happening. Right? The Oracle just says, I'm going to sign the weather. Um, but then we can use the Oracle's key to in a similar way as Lightning, um, to endorse one transaction. So the way you do it, OK, a couple minutes. Uh, so there's Schnorr signatures, which hopefully we'll get into Bitcoin soon. Uh, this is all happening offline, so we don't need Schnorr signatures to be operating on the Bitcoin network in order to do this. We do this completely you know, offline. Um, the idea of a Schnorr signature is it's pretty straightforward. Uh, you have a pub key. You make this other sort of temporary pub key, which like k times g is r. And then you just compute, OK, I'm going to take my temporary private key minus the hash of my message in r times my private key. Compute what that is. And then uh, when you want to verify, you just multiply everything by g, see if it equals what it should. right? So they give you s and r. You, you compute this. Oh, why, how do I get rid of that? Oh, OK. There we go. So you compute, OK. This is the signature, right? So in, in Bitcoin, in Bitcoin today, it's, it's, it's a ECDSA, which is slightly different, but same idea. I give you two things, right? I give you this point on the curve and this scalar, and you see if this relationship holds true. And if it does, it's a valid signature. Uh, so what discrete log contracts does is it changes things up a little bit. And it says, well, until now, we've been saying that the public key is a point on the curve, and the signature is this two things, right? A scalar and a point. Um, what if we moved? We keep the equations the same, but now we say, OK, this pub key actually is two points. I've, already, you know, I've pre committed to the r value. And then the signature is just s. It's the same equation, same thing's going on, but I just move one thing to you know, the beginning when I'm sharing my pub key. Um, what's interesting is this actually, the reason that you don't do this normally is this lets you only sign once. Uh, so if you know, like, if you reuse the same r value, people can find your private key. This is what happened. Uh, the PlayStation 3 back in the day when uh, GeoHot, I think, or other people found the private key from it. They kept reusing the same R value. I think Blockchain Info had a bunch of problems with people reusing the same R value. Um, so you don't want to do this normally, right? This makes your signature one-time use. But it does also allow this really cool thing where you can figure out what their signatures will look like. So you can say, okay, if I know A and R, and I just come up with any given message, I can compute uh, not the signature, but I can compute the signature times g. So if we think of a signature as a private key, I can compute what that public key would be. Um, so this is kind of a weird thing you can do where I can't figure out what the signature will be, but I can figure out the sort of pub key version of the signature. Um, and so this is sort of a weird way to think of signatures as private keys and like this sort of public key version of the signature, but that lets you uh, take this Oracle signature and use it as a private key in your own transactions and combine it with existing private keys uh, so that you can do these contracts. Um, yeah, it's an unknown scale. So it's the third party Oracle. It's a really nice Oracle model. In many other uh, Oracle models, like in Ethereum or other things, generally the Oracle has full visibility into the smart contract. So they know what's going to happen when they say, oh yeah, the price of this went to this. Um, what's nice in this model is the Oracle has no idea that they're even being used. They just say, look, I'm going to sign the price of Bitcoin tomorrow. And then they do. And maybe smart contracts use that data. Maybe they don't. You can't tell. Uh, when, once it gets into the blockchain, 
it's mixed in with other key data, and so you can't discern it at all. Um, so it's a little bit lonely for the Oracle because nobody, they don't know if anyone's actually using their services. Uh, it's going to be hard for them to make money, but um, it's a really nice privacy uh, feature. Okay, um, yeah, so that's basic idea. Uh, there's use cases. I think one of the use cases would be like currency futures where you could make contracts based on the price of Bitcoin settled in Bitcoin. So basically the opposite of what uh, CME and CBOT kind of places are doing now where you say, okay, I've got a, you're going to deliver me $10,000 worth of Bitcoin next month. Uh, and you're, you know, so I say, I, I have Bitcoin, but I don't really have Bitcoin, right? I know I'm getting $10,000 worth. If the price of Bitcoin goes up, I get fewer of them. If I, the price of Bitcoin goes down, I'm going to get more of them out of this contract. So I don't have to worry about the Bitcoin price. And then the person on the other side of that says, I have like these 2x ultra volatile Bitcoins. And they're, when they go to the moon, they're really going to the moon. Um, and if they go down, I just lose everything. Um, you can also do a lot of other stuff, you know, betting, gambling. That's probably what people are going to do with it, too. Um, it's pretty general. It's, the only downsides are you have to sort of enumerate all possible outcomes. So for some types of things, it doesn't work. Um, if there's like sort of exponential, like there could be any bazillion number of things happening, it doesn't really work. Um, but if you can sort of quantitize and say, okay, there's a million possible outcomes from this contract and we can get it down to a million, okay, you can do this, right? A million times maybe 100 bytes each state. It's 100 megabytes. It's doable. That 100 megabytes might exist on the user's computers, but what goes into the blockchain is just one transaction. Um, so I think this is a pretty cool model. Okay, uh, especially smart contracts. I've got like, what, two minutes for questions? Two, three, uh, if anyone has questions. And if we have time, and if you don't have time, come bug me after. Anyone have questions? <laughs> you can just yell and I'll, oh, hey, talk. Yell and I'll repeat it. <laughs> um, so does Rakuten allow for delegated signing? Delegated signing. Uh, yes, kind of, yes. Uh, so Graftroot, you could, the issue with Graftroot is there is sort of a root key that creates all the scripts. Uh, you can make that root key interactive. There's also a way to make, to prove that that root key doesn't even exist and it's endorsed a script by sort of working backwards. Um, but if you do have a key, you can sort of delegate and say, okay, I have this key. I'm also, you know, I'll also sign off on a script where you have a key and you can sign. Um, the question is, do we make it recursive? You say, okay, there's key A, which signs key B, which can then sign any other keys and like keep going down. Uh, it wouldn't be that hard to make it recursive, but that like last week at the Bitcoin Core Dev meetup, people were sort of arguing about like, no, that's crazy. We can't let them do that. And like, no, why not? There's no problem. So whether it's recursive or not, will allow like sort of indefinite delegation, but we'll see. Any other questions? Oh, oh here? Yeah. Just yell, yeah. Uh, <laughs> or there's a microphone, yeah. <laughs> is it working? Okay, yeah. So, so my question to you is, uh, since it doesn't have really a dependency on the Bitcoin core network, I mean, sh this should be pretty live pretty fast, right? Uh, what doesn't have a dependency on core network? Like, you, you're just doing a lightning network and just passing the message to the, the Bitcoin blockchain or any blockchain that you need. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the idea of these systems is, you know, you're, use, you're, you're using the Bitcoin network or, you know, a, a similarly compatible network as a you know, court in essential. Like, so as long as everyone's getting along, you just use multi-sig. Um, in these contracts as well, only the result of the contract needs to be posted to the blockchain. The actual terms of the contract never show up. So, so. which means that uh, technically you could be live tomorrow uh, if you needed. Oh, you, you, all yeah. of this, well, okay, Graftroot and Taproot would be a soft fork. Uh, discrete log contracts, yeah, you could, you know, I've been working on it. Uh, you, there's no, no soft forks needed. You could do it on the network today. Same, same, it looks, from, from, if you look at it, the block, it looks the exact same as um, Lightning. You can't just distinguish data. between yeah, just the two. additional data. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So it, it could work today. Okay. I just, you know, got to code the whole okay. thing. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. You don't need Schnorr. The Schnorr is, is like, but the, the Schnorr is interactive. It, sorry, non-interactive Oracle uses it. So you, you're using the Schnorr algorithm, but offline in order to compute, like, private keys that we then use for ECDSA. Okay, other, or we did? The, the smart contracts aren't, they're in Bitcoin script. It, it's basically, there's not really a programming language. You sort of just enumerate all possible outcomes and make transactions for each. Uh, so it's, it's not a language so much as, okay, what are, all the, what are the possible things that can happen? 
let's code all those, you know, let's make a transaction for all of those. Uh, so you can sort of look at it as a giant OR gate. Uh, <laughs> so circuit-wise, I don't know. Okay, so, yep, that's that time. Okay, thanks a lot. Ask questions. Yep, thanks.